Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I'm Mary Eisen, sitting in for Jonathan Hessen. With the war in Ukraine only several weeks away from its first anniversary, it has obviously become the most important issue for Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's going out of his way to salvage some part of his failed gamble on a clear victory. Putin is therefore now courting Iran, despite a lot of negative history between Moscow and Tehran. And the Russian military has become dependent on various kinds of Iranian weapons, most prominently drones. How deep are these relations? Can they outlast the war? What impact are they having on the Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran's nuclear project? Joining us from central Israel are Professor Zev Hanin, expert on Russian and Middle Eastern studies, Bar Ilan and Ariel Universities. Thanks. Doctor, Wonderful to be with you. And Dr. Meir Javendanfar, Iranian lecturer at Reichman University. Thank you. And with us, as always, TV7's own analyst, Amir Owen. Amir, let us dive into the subject. Russia, Iran, implications. Thank you, Miri. Good to see you here sitting in for Jonathan. Um, and you know, it is said that uh, being um, at the gallows uh, does a lot to sharpen one's mind, to focus on uh, what's ahead. And the same is probably true regarding nations and rulers. And uh, once Russia has uh, started to wage war in Ukraine, against Ukraine, obviously this takes precedence over any other subject. So while in general um, Russia is against nuclear proliferation and Russia has been one of the parties to the 2015 agreement with Iran and um, has never backtracked uh, from it, Obviously, now that it is uh, somewhat dependent on outside military help uh, regarding uh, the Ukraine, it um, has more of uh, a mind to help Iran um, reciprocally if Iran asks for uh, such help. And um, the help Iran might ask for has to do with uh, other weapons, such as the uh, Sukhoi 35, which according to reports uh, has already been uh, offered or perhaps even uh, sold to Iran with Iranian pilots uh, being trained, uh, being converted from uh, American type uh, fighter planes to the uh, Russian uh, made one. And perhaps uh, also regarding the Iranian presence in Syria and um, what Iran is doing in its uh, nuclear project. Down the road, Israel might, fi might find itself against Russia if Israel tries to attack Iran. This is not for tomorrow. The Israeli intelligence uh, experts say it is at least two years away. Um, the, the outgoing defense minister, Benny Gantz, uh, when he uh, uh, departed from office, said that in two or three years, Israel might face um, Iran. But nevertheless, it changes the entire strategic equation. So what we're talking about right now is both Russia and Iran. And as you said, it's a strategic change. And if I think of what that means in our terms, and Professor Hanin, I'm going to start with you about Russia at the moment. I'd like to hear more from you. Do you view this as a strategic change? Russia has already been involved with Iran over the last years. This isn't something new. Russia and Iran have had what I would call a budding economic relationship. So are what we're seeing now because of the war in Ukraine, a strategic change for Russia? Or is this only tactics because they need Iran at the moment? Uh, Miri, if you're asking me whether it's a strategic change or just a tactic shift, I would say that that's the first much more than the second. Uh, the short answer is yes, that's strategic change. Uh, let us uh, come back a little bit for a few years before. Uh, in order to understand what was the geostrategic approach of uh, Kremlin 
uh, or it's better to say team of Vladimir Putin, in concern of their policy uh, in various uh, regions of the world. Uh, we can realize the fact that, uh, according to Russia, uh, they uh, it's presented itself as a uh, like a multiple player uh, on different platforms, uh, different areas. That means for Putin was very important to show that he is able to speak with everybody, with Europeans, with Americans, even if this dialogue uh, from time to time uh, was, I would say, not so friendly as both sides would like to see it. Uh, but uh, um, and uh, on the other hand, if we're coming here in the Middle East, according to uh, official Russian approach, they had two allies here in the Middle East. One is Iran and the second is Israel. Regardless of the fact that uh, relations between these two countries uh, knew better times, let me put it this way. Uh, so um, uh, according to Vladimir Putin in this situation, uh, he thought that he is able to do uh, like we say in Hebrew, in, uh, in English, adventures, uh, meaning uh, uh, step by step uh, to push its agenda uh, forward in the international relations without getting any revenge or any uh, like strong feedback from the West, from NATO and the United States, first of all. Um, uh, there, are, there were several reasons to think like that, uh, meaning uh, in 2008, uh, they had, there was war in Georgia and nothing happened. Uh, in 2014, uh, they appended Crimea and nothing happened. Uh, in uh, uh, 2020, uh, they uh, did everything in their power and succeeded to preserve pro-Russian regime in Belarusia. And the same way, uh, uh, in, uh, it was in 2019, in 2020, in 2020, 21, 22, actually there was a actual strengthening of the Russian presence in the southern Caucasus. Uh, meaning uh, Azerbaijan-Armenian uh, war, and in the Central Asia, they preserve the Russian regime in Kazakhstan. So, so if, uh, I, if I take uh, what you're talking about, Professor Khanin, you're basically saying that this is more of Russian strategy and it's grand strategy adding Iran into the equation. Uh, well, um, uh, on one hand, it is so. On the other hand, they also are able to play games, uh, whether they're satisfied with Iran and not satisfied, just to, to balance between the forces. Now, the situation is absolutely different. Uh, uh, Putin made a huge mistake uh, uh, invading, uh, uh, due to invasion of Ukraine. And now um, uh, the West is trying to push it uh, as much as possible into the corner. He doesn't, uh, doesn't have any other choice but to rely on the eastward allies. Uh, China uh, actually is going to play its own game, so there, are no, there is no much choice but to take uh, to, to come stronger and stronger in relations with Iran. Uh, actually, and uh, uh, in continuation, one more point, if you please. Uh, uh, what Amir said, yes, I do believe that in so at a certain point of time, it could be uh, that Israel and Russia will be on the different sides of the struggle. Uh, if there uh, was struggle, if we are talking about uh, necessity to attack Iran, but it could happen even before. Uh, it could happen in Syria if Russia, who actually refrained from uh, making any steps to prevent Israeli attacks of uh, uh, Iranian proxy and Iranian forces there, uh, in the current situation, it might be a ne uh, feel necessary uh, to stand together with Iran, and that's already a different story. That's absolutely a different story. And as I listen to what you said right now, I'm thinking to myself, uh, Mayor, of the difference between Iran, the regional power, and Russia, the world power. Because one of those differences there is that we were talking about a world power and a regional power. And yet, it seems right now that Iran in its own way has kind of gained something out of the failure of Russia against Ukraine. And I'm wondering in that sense if, as I look at that, has Iran gained? Is this just the circumstances? Has it changed something for Iran within the Middle East? Or is this just for Iran a lucky chance that's happening as of now? Thank you, Mary. It's great to be with you and all my colleagues. Um, Iran needs a strong Russia. A strong Russia is in, in the interest of Iran because Iran feels that Russia is one of the few countries, especially Putin, that understands the threat posed by the West's soft power. Uh, as you can remember, there was the Rose and the Orange Revolutions in Georgia and Ukraine in 2003 and 2004, respectively. 
the, the Iranian regime and the Putin regime both saw these revolutions as soft velvet revolutions financed by the West. Um, they also view, of course, that Putin, the Putin, the, the later revolutions in in uh, in the uh, in uh, in Ukraine in two thousand and eight, and of course the Maidan revolution. This was also viewed as a soft power, and the Islamic Republic of Iran views the West soft power as more a, a, an existential threat than a, than than the West's hard power. And this is something that the Islamic Republic of Iran views that China, that the Russian, that President Putin and Xi Jinping in China understand. This is one of the reasons why uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran wants to be on the side of Russia in this war. There are other reasons, of course, uh, Iran has shared interests with Russia in the Caucasus region. The, the recent war between Azerbaijan and Armenia in 2020 the Azerbaijanis, whom Iran views as being supported by Turkey and Israel, uh, basically uh, captured lands that that uh, once the Azerbaijanis, uh, once the Armenians hand them over, will mean that Iran will no longer have a border with Armenia. And this is a major setback for the Iranians, and the Iranians want a ru strong Russia to side up with Armenia against Azerbaijan to to ensure that this does not happen. Iran also has shared interests with Syria, with Russia in Syria. Of course, the Russians are seen as being double players, uh, also having good relations with Israel. But the Iranians have noticed how after reports of transfer of S-300s, anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems from Syria to Ukraine in August, suddenly, according to foreign uh, news reports, Israel is targeting uh, the, the airports of, of the Assad regime in Syria, in Aleppo, and in, in Damascus. This is unprecedented. So Iran also wants a strong Russia there. And uh, this is a strategic change for Iran to side with Russia because Iran could have stayed on the sideline. It could have even uh, reached a return to the nuclear deal. And Iran could now be selling oil instead of Russia uh, in the mark, international market, but Iran decided to back Russia and not to go to go back to the JCPOA, which means that Iran is also under sanctions. But there are, of course, domestic and foreign policy reasons why Ayatollah Khamenei made this monumental decision, and we can talk about that later on. Amazing. Here we are sitting in Jerusalem, talking about Russia and Iran, talking with these experts about their interests and this alignment of strategic interests, and I come back into the Jerusalem studio. Amir, let's take this into our arena. We heard Syria, we heard Turkey, we heard Iran. You mentioned before the nuclear option. At the end, how does this play out in its own way when it comes to Israel? I'm kind of worried in its own way that we're caught in between a very challenging relationship. So Israel uh, has seen... Uh, an earlier incarnation of what happens when uh, two superpowers, the Soviet Union, or now Russia, and the United States confront each other, but do not want this friction to involve their own combat troops. And that means allies, partners, clients, proxies. When the uh, Soviets penetrated the Middle East, which used to be under British domination, and then the Americans uh, came in supplanting the, the British, they wanted a foothold in Syria for many reasons. But one of them was to counterbalance Turkey, which was and still is a NATO uh, member and um, yeah. an ancient rival of Russia. But... We didn't see Syria helping the Soviet Union by sending troops. Cuba, on the other hand, did send its own, its own boots on the ground um, to uh, the uh, Southern Africa battle uh, uh, fields, such as Angola. And Iran may yet, because of the Russian shortage in infantry and other troops and, and the, the Wagner group and all of that, Iran may find itself being asked to at least send Shiite militias, not Iranian youth, but Afghanis or Pakistanis or other of the sort um, now in Syria to the Ukraine. We have not seen the end of this story. Well, I'm going to take that one in a moment. I'm going to get back to, to Dr. Hanin, but I have to ask you, Mayo, do you see a situation that the Islamic regime of Iran would agree to send 
um, Muslim, in that sense, Shiite fighters in any sort of auspice to actually fight with Russia against Ukraine? I mean, it's a question we could ask on the opposite side of what's happened within Ukraine, but I'm focused right now on Iran. I've always noticed that Iran has been very shy of sending its own soldiers anywhere around the world. They're more than happy to send <clears throat> other soldiers. Would they send other soldiers to fight against Ukraine with Russia? Uh, to be honest, it's possible, but you know, sending Shia militia, who are, from my understanding, who are not very well trained, from a very warm desert climate to fight in the very cold climate of uh, Ukraine, which is a completely different topography, and with soldiers who don't understand the language, you know, one well, the Russians speak Russian and these soldiers speak Arabic. I'm not sure the Russians would want it, but I think it's possible that the that the uh, that the Russians will ask for it, and I think it's possible. Sorry, and I, I think it's possible that the Iranians would agree if the Russians asked for it, but I'm not sure the Russians would ask for it. But let me tell you something else, uh, Mary. I think there is so much hatred for Putin and for Ayatollah Khamenei today that if the uh, if Vladimir Zelensky can came and said, "I will offer citizenship to whoever." fights for my country, I'm sure there'll be many thousands of volunteers from Syria and also from Iran. I'm not saying tens of thousands, but you could see thousands of Iranians joining uh, Zelensky to fight against Putin because uh, because they see Putin as, as the support of Ayatollah Khamenei. And also Iranians are so desperate today that some of them may be willing to fight for Ukraine just to get Ukrainian citizenship. Meaning you've already gone into the Iranian opposition and those voices that we have been hearing over the last few months. You're not talking about the Islamic regime. You're talking about those who oppose it and would look for a different way to fight against that. Of course. But if I absolutely, but if I look at that in that sense, Professor Khamin, I'm fascinated in that sense by this change in Russia, because in its own way, what you described before is that it's not a change that Russia, in that sense, views itself as a world power and always has for the last hundred years, not for the last two years, that it views its own capabilities. So you have to try and dive in, in that sense, with this Russia-Iran aspect. What can we expect? Would they now try to block any anti-Iran um, action sanction against them? Are they absolutely now going to be the ones who are going to be um, the Iranian protectors on the world floor right now? That that's how much they view themselves as being anti-West in that sense? Well, I would say that uh, mm, there are a couple of things that uh, Russian regime or Russian government should take up, uh, and I'm sure it's taken into account uh, in order to survive, first of all. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Putin regime or anybody who might exchange him uh, uh, in the near or distant future. Uh, so at the moment, the situation more or less is defaulting. They have a few uh, unexpected events uh, and, and uh, events that they um, wouldn't like to, or didn't expect that that would come when they started all this story. Uh, one uh, is actually the extension of NATO. Uh, the whole operation was uh, in order to stop the extension of NATO, they, they got the opposite. Uh, the second uh, is actually uh, the, the, the race of Turkey. The relations between Moscow and uh, uh, Ankara was like uh, like Americans say they were frenemy, you know. With this sort of friends, you don't need enemies. Um, uh, but still, uh, uh, Moscow uh, and uh, and Putin and Erdogan they balanced between different uh, uh, subjects uh, that they had to uh, deal with, uh, and they actually enjoyed uh, from this sort of uh, of relations. Uh, sometimes they confronted, sometimes they helped each other. Uh, but at the moment, uh, Turkey actually is exchanging Russia in the areas like Southern Caucasus, like Middle East area, uh, uh, some areas in the Middle East, or uh, big Middle East, like we call it, uh, meaning that uh, 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 which uh, Russia uh, saw as an alternative area, area of their control and their influence. Uh, so at the moment, they need to, to, to do something about it. Uh, there are very few uh, possible allies left or, or countries that they are able to cooperate uh, in order to, you know, uh, uh, to put aside any one of them. Uh, among them, of course, China uh, and, and Iran is the most important. They wouldn't also like to have Israel on their side, uh, on their side in the way that Israel will continue not to intervene 
and not to interfere at least openly into uh, Russia-Ukrainian war, uh, uh, meaning that uh, we can uh, saw as an indication uh, the role of, of Jewish communities in both countries. Uh, in Ukraine, the Jewish community is totally uh, uh, mobilized itself in favor of uh, uh, support of the regime, you know, of, of the government of Vladimir Zelensky. In Russia, as the best and the Kremlin is pretty happy about it, uh, that uh, Jewish community expresses the loyalty and uh, doesn't do anything more than that. It's also, it's also okay. So from the, the, through these Jewish communities, both in Russia and Ukraine, they're trying to influence Israel to continue its own uh, uh, way of policy, so human support, of humanitarian support, diplomatic support, and so on uh, in, of Ukraine, but not more than that. So from this point of view, I would say that uh, 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 at the moment, uh, uh, a Russian government doesn't have any uh, choices other than uh, uh, to make it more and more close to cooperation with Iran. Uh, and trying to, on the other hand, uh, uh, at, at least to express, at least to show, at least to declare that they have uh, uh, good relations, still have good relations with, country, with countries uh, that belong to the Western Bloc, including Israel. Well, that's a fascinating way. And as we go around towards the end, I mean, I'm thinking about the Samir right now. And again, I'm coming back to Israel. So it's Russia, it's Iran. We have full diplomatic ties with Russia. We have an important community here, as mentioned, of Russian speakers that are both from the Ukraine and from Russia. So in this relationship between Russia and Iran, do you expect changes from the newly um, established Israeli government towards the Russia-Iranian issue? Is this something that we're going to see changes here? Will that impact us in this upcoming future? It's a bit uh, megalomaniac, and it was when Naftali Bennett was the prime minister, to believe that Israel can mediate uh, between uh, Putin and Zelensky. And uh, yes, uh, there is uh, an op a Nobel Prize for peace uh, available for whoever finds the formula uh, which will enable both Putin and Zelensky to declare themselves victors. And right now, uh, we are um, talking here we are um, in the first month of 2023. We may still find ourselves here in a few months' time, next year, maybe even after that. Um, Vladimir Putin seems to be the new, the Russian, Saddam Hussein. When Saddam, mm -hmm. when Saddam attacked Iran in September of 1980, he believed that Iran is weak and um, is going to topple immediately. It took eight years, and yes, uh, Khomeini eventually um, agreed to some humiliating uh, terms. But here too, if uh, we are still stuck with Putin and Zelensky, we may see this uh, war of attrition going on for years on end. If we look at this towards the end, and I'd like each one of you to address this briefly in that sense, do you see, uh, Mayor, a change happening with the Islamic regime of Iran in this year because of the Ukraine, because of Syria, because of the domestic issues inside Iran? Do you expect any changes there in their international policy? I, I don't see it because uh, Ayatollah Khamenei right now views America as being behind the recent uprising in Iran. He sees the uprising in Iran as an American plot in order to weaken Iran, in order to, to stop its missile program, to stop its drone program, to stop its presence in the region. And I don't see, uh, and, and Ayatollah Khamenei has already made his bet with Putin. Uh, he's, he's not going to be able to, to leave the position because that would cost him too dearly. And I have to say, it's even costing Iran in terms of relations with China. We saw that Xi Jinping visited, visited Saudi Arabia and he, and he issued a joint statement asking Iran not to interfere in the affairs of other countries. And this really angered the Iranians. But uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei has no other choice uh, but to continue with Putin. <clears throat> and he sees Putin as his only ally right now to confront the United States. And if I were to advise the government of Israel humbly, I would say when it comes to uh, addressing the issue of uh, Russia in Syria and Russia's relations with Iran, one of the most important issues is to handle our relationship with the United States very carefully and very responsibly. We need to work with tandem with the Americans on this issue as well, because that will only strengthen our position, because we don't know where this Russia-Iran position 
how in the in the future could could threaten us. Maybe not now, but in the future. And to confront this threat, we need the diplomatic support of the United States. It's a fascinating way of looking at it and in its own way, a little bit humbling, looking at it both through the eyes of Israel and in our implications. And Professor Hanin, in that sense, as I ask you, so what can we expect from Russia when it comes to Iran in the upcoming months? Will it flourish into more? Is it going to expand? Or is this very much Russia trying to control it? And I'd add into that question, do you see any kind of situation, and I'm a little worried about that, Russia as this immense nuclear power looking at an Iranian nuclear capability as something that the Russians could live with, which is a very scary thought. How do you see these different aspects? Uh, my short answer to your first question is yes, absolutely. Uh, my second, uh, my answer to your second question... You may have to repeat the question, people may not remember. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I see. concerning the nuclear uh, armament, use of nuclear armament, it's pretty unlikely. Concerning the more close uh, uh, strategic cooperation with Iran, uh, it, it's pretty likely, Leah, yeah, that, that that is what can, can, can continue to be. And here I, uh, I agree with our Iranian colleague. Zaev, thank you so much for that. And that brings me at the end to really trying to understand, Amir, what do you think we can expect from the Russia-Iran relationship? So it's even more complicated than that because in order for Benjamin Netanyahu to be on uh, President Biden's good graces vis-a-vis -vis Iran, he must be more moderate on the Palestinian front. And that right now seems like a remote possibility. Absolutely. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to Amir. Thank you and Shalom from Jerusalem Studio.